today on Call Out. Whistler search and rescue long lines and injured snowmobile are off a steep mountainside. Uh, it doesn't look possible to do a heavy hopper, so we will be doing a long line rescue, a HETS mission here. And later, expert trackers Darcy Fear and Bart Bjorkman race against time to find hidden hiker Callie Chatton. I've taken myself on a little walk to get lost and see if they can find me. Wednesday, 2.37 p.m. Whistler Search and Rescue was called out to help extricate an injured snowmobiler. The injured subject is Virginia Smith, a Whistler resident and self-described gin of all trades, who works as a horse farrier, go-go dancer, bartender, model, stunt woman, the list goes on. A highly experienced snowmobiler, Virginia has crashed her sled and is trapped on a very steep incline terrified to move for fear that she has a broken neck. I have just uh, notified my uh, rescue team members uh, to be on standby, get their gear ready. I am on my way to the staging area to prepare for the helicopter landing. A helicopter travels to the top of Whistler Mountain to pick up pro ski patrollers Darren Romano and Kevin Sebald. Brad Sills is picked up near his Callahan Valley Ski Resort. The three-person rescue team, with pilot Steve Gray, have more than 60 years of experience in mountain rescue. Their destination, Brandywine Mountain. Located in the southern coast mountains of British Columbia, the Brandywine Valley is a favorite spot for outdoor recreationists and can attract well over 100 snowmobilers on any given day during the season. The sport of snowmobiling is a lot of fun, but it can be deadly. The practice of high marking, riding up to the highest point possible on a steep mountain slope, can lead to a yard sale, both sled and rider tumbling down the mountain. And that's just the lucky ones. In the wrong place at the wrong time, the weight and torque of these powerful machines will easily set off avalanches, burying the rider. And then there's the simple factor of speed versus terrain. The Brandywine Valley has its own special challenge the S shoot. It's very steep, probably in the neighborhood somewhere between 40 and 45 degrees, depending on the time of the year. And about halfway up the chute at about probably six to 700 vertical feet, it has a dog's leg marked with a large rock in the middle of it. And you have to turn quite radically one way or the other to get around this rock. Meanwhile, keeping full power on, because if you don't, uh, you'll start flipping uh, and you'll roll right to the bottom of the chute. The team arrives on site. They can see Virginia lying in the S chute, comforted by friends. I was a mess. I'd been laying there for about two and a half hours. I was starting to get very cold. I was starting to shake. I was crying a little. I was breathing heavy. Um, I was pretty much having a, a full-on panic attack. Virginia recounts how her accident occurred. I hit an ice chunk and I went right into the rock and the snowmobile came back. I got kicked off the back of it and it started to cartwheel down. I could feel it and hear it coming down behind me. And then, uh, then it impacted right on my back. It rolled right over the back of my head and then I slid for about 30 feet and then I stopped and I decided not to move. There was a million things running through my mind um, with the amount of pain that I had. I was al almost already looking into the future, you know, how long is this going to be to recover? You know, you know what's, what's going to happen to me? Because I knew that I wasn't going to be able to get out of there by myself. And then I heard the helicopters come in. The rescue team circles the area to assess the situation and develop a rescue plan. We did our initial checks, uh, wind speeds, wind direction, sun angles, atmospheric density, uh, are there downdrafts? Most of the avalanche activity had already occurred. We did look at a technique called heli hover in which the pilot will keep full power on the helicopter and will come into a very close hover somewhere between two to eight feet above the ground. But the steepness of the slope and the fact that we had no way of telling whether snowmobilers 
could enter the slope. And once they were in the slope, they're powerless to stop. It's that steep. They would come down. And of course, if we were trying to load somebody, they'd come right into the rotor system and we would all have a very bad day. In fact, a snowmobile came over the top and stopped when he saw the subject, took off his helmet, and we were able to yell at him if he would mind uh, becoming a sentry. And uh, he performed that duty, which was a great relief to all of us. The rescue proceeds. Medical team leader Kevin Sebald is dropped off above the S chute and skis down to Virginia with a spinal board. I was in quite a bit of shock at that point. How are we doing? I was sure that I had broken my neck from the amount of pain that I was feeling. I had heard crunching and cracking when the sled rolled over my head. He uh, reassured me that everything was going to be okay and that he had a, a crew put together and we're going to put you on a spinal board and he was going to get me out of there and uh, everything was going to be fine. I, I felt very safe. Coming down your shoulder now, shoulder's okay. Because the area is too steep for either a tow out by snowmobile or to hover the helicopter and load Virginia in, they opt for a HETS mission, lifting Virginia out using a long line. We will be doing uh, a long line rescue, a HETS mission here. Darren is getting dressed to be on the end of the line, and I will be spotting. That's Kevin calling. Uh, okay, Brad, we're doing quite well. I've got a bench shoveled out here. Our scene is looking fairly secure, and we're ready anytime. Yeah, roger that. We're just uh, finishing up the configuration here. Darren will yeah, come off the line with the yeah, ARP and assist you in uh, loading her in the uh, ETA about five minutes. Copy that. Sounds good, Brad. Okay. circles while Darren and Kevin attach a cervical collar to keep Virginia's spinal column properly aligned during transport. It's gonna be okay. Cinched to a spinal board and bundled in the ARP, Virginia is packaged and ready for delivery to the hospital. It's not all that comfortable, but it is safe. I was pretty much packaged up like a burrito. Um, it was completely dark and I could hear the helicopters coming in, but I couldn't see them. The helicopter returns and picks them up. Normally we fly with our back to the wind once he uh, brings it up to speed, and uh, we wore a flight helmet with a boom mic on it. We've got hand signals that we use. There's always direct communication to the helicopter pilot. If we start to spin a little bit, we can put an arm out to stop us from spinning. It's just a matter of floating and just let the helicopter pilot do all the work. Darren was incredible. He held my hand the whole way as we were um, taking off. But the spinning was what was really getting to me. The slow spin. Um, just the sound of the helicopter, it was, you know, it's just a lot to take in, in one day. She was a little bit nervous when we kind of did a big spin in the air. I was talking to her as we were flying and her hands started to wiggle out a bit, so I just held her hand for a minute and she said that felt better. Virginia is lowered to the ground, where she will be moved to the awaiting medevac helicopter. We're inbound. Yeah, he needs to notify the EHS. And the clinic. How was that, Virginia? Could you see anything? No, it was all dark. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. It's our base. Our base uh, for anyone in uh, West Virginia. Yeah, 
itchy complaint like a cervical 345 area. So that concludes a successful mission here. Uh, the patient is now in the medevac helicopter. She will be transported to Whistler Clinic at this time. The helicopter lifts off carrying a very thankful Virginia Smith. They were amazing. I was really impressed on how organized they were and how relaxed they made me feel. They were all very friendly and very professional. And uh, I'm really glad we have them. Virginia is bruised and torn, but she'll recover fully with a new perspective. I have a great urge to get back out on my snowmobile. It's really fun to see what your machine can do, um, how far you can go. I, I have a great time with it because I'm really light and I have a very powerful machine and uh, I can usually out high mark the guys and I think that's the thrill of it for me is the fact that, you know, I can go up there and, and kind of show them up whereas a lot of sports are very male dominated. I just feel like I learned a big lesson and I think that I might have been pushing it a little bit more than I should have and uh, it really was a wake-up call that I have many, many more years of sledding in front of me and um, I'm just going to play it safer. Now, trackers Darcy Fear and Bart Bjorkman have three hours and five square kilometers to locate hidden hiker Callie Chatton. Found a perfect spot to hide out. I just need to get myself up to these bluffs. Thursday, 12.31 p.m. Expert trackers Bart Bjorkman and Darcy Fear are called out to search for a missing hiker. Callie Chatton was reported overdue when she failed to return from a morning stroll through the woods near her friend's farm where she was visiting. We know that the uh, young lady has gone on this trail. It's a well-used trail. Uh, Darcy's up behind me now trying to establish her footprints. This is an exercise. The two trackers, Bart and Darcy, with more than 30 years tracking experience between them, will attempt to find Callie, a Nelson Search and Rescue Team member. The trackers will follow Callie's tracks through five square kilometers of varied terrain until they find her. They've got three hours. But Callie isn't gonna make this easy for them. With a 30 minute head start, she will attempt to elude the two experts, trying her best not to leave any clues along the way. I've taken myself on a little walk to get lost and see if they can find me. Bart and Darcy move to the top of the hill from the subject's last known position and make their first important discovery in a track trap, a soft patch of ground likely to capture a shoe sole impression. What we're seeing here is um, a fairly good print as prints go for us. You can actually see the outline of the toe here and some of the pattern of the sole. Uh, what Darcy has done is he's measured from the heel to the toe, the width of the heel, and the length of the heel. He's also drawn in his picture all of these different formations or patterns of the tread. These measurements are compared to the known size and brand of the subject's shoes as well as any other information gathered from interviews with family and friends. We got the length is right to 10 and 3 quarter inches, 4 and a quarter wide, so it's a female hiker boot for sure. This is their prime sign, the signature print they'll use to find Callie and will help establish her initial direction of travel. I think we'll follow her up this trail and see where she goes across this field. The trackers mark the print with surveyor's tape to prevent contamination then set the stride length and length of the footprint on the tracking sticks using elastics. One of the things we do uh, when we're tracking is to identify the stride length. The stride length is the distance between the toe of one foot and the heel of the next. The second thing we do is we put the, the footprint on our stick. So this would be the stride, this would be the footprint length. By putting this down on top of the footprint that we can find, we know that the stride is roughly this distance, we can actually pivot our stick back and forth and figure out roughly where the next footprint should be. And sometimes because we're dealing with such small evidence, this is really the only way that we can actually figure out where the next footprint's going to be. It's just basically a, a direction of travel device. Um, you see the Establishing direction of travel can narrow the search area significantly. 
Trackers are usually called in at the very beginning of a search. Uh, the reason being is by having uh, trackers go in and establish direction of travel, search managers can actually look at a topographical map and see where the, the uh, most natural places for people to walk. A lost subject can travel at an average pace of three kilometers per hour, which continually increases the size of the search area. By establishing a direction of travel and considering the most likely areas a person would walk, a search area this big can be narrowed down to focus on an area this big. It's now 45 minutes into the search, and the tracking team has hit a roadblock, a hard-packed field that shows no sign. At 250 pounds, if I step on the ground, there's really no pattern. There's nothing you can see there. So what we're going to do is Darcy's going out about 20 meters, and he's going to cut for sign. He's actually going to cut across the top of the field, hopefully uh, finding where the young lady walked through. Cutting is a common practice, with one or more tracker teams searching ahead while one stays on prime. If one of the sign-cutting teams finds a new prime sign, they become the primary team and the other teams leapfrog ahead, and so on. This speeds up the search and helps to continually refine the subject's direction of travel. As he cuts, Darcy drags a stick in the ground, thereby distinguishing his tracks from other sign. Because we have a large field here, what we'd look for too is what we call shine or flagging. Uh, shine is just basically uh, what we see when the lighter sides of the, the, the plant or the foliage will show up and the sun will actually shine on it differently than it will the darker plants along either side. Um, the other thing too is the flagging is the way the grass is, is bent down. So in this particular case you can see that the direction of travel was this way. The cutting pays off. They find more sign on the northwest side of the field. We can see a little bit of a toe dig here and it lines up with our, our stick. There's another toe dig here. Another one here, a big one here. It's definitely not animal, but it lines up with our stick from toe to heel. It's turning into a beautiful day to get myself lost. The sun's coming out, at least a wee bit, and found a perfect spot to hide out. I just need to get myself up to these bluffs, see if I can find a good vantage spot. As Callie settles into her hiding place, the tracker team works their way towards some woods finding more sign in the softer earth. What do we got here? What's the next one? Here. That ain't no deer. Yeah, That's a lug. There's lugs. That looks like it's heel. What we have to do as trackers now is what we call make or break this, this line of sign. We have to follow along and see, because it could be a hunter, it could be anybody. Uh, what we have to do is see if we can actually find some proof that it's actually our person, our lost person. The team is definitely back on track as they follow Callie's sign into a forested area. Fresh break, and you can almost see the whole footprint here. Just crunched everything. All these plants have been broken off fresh. This is definitely not elk, this is human. Step right here. Yeah, I got something real good here. Bart and Darcy pick up speed now, narrowing the gap as they find sign after sign. Oh, 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 stand by. They must be getting close to finding Callie. See, that looks like lug time. But yeah, there's a lot of disturbance right up there. But look at this here as well. Yeah, I see that. No, I don't think that's her. No, I think it's too small for her. <laughs> Absolutely. This has all been pulled back. If this was pulled apart, that's her toe. I can definitely hear their voices. And I can see them just coming into one of the clearings through the trees, so. They're definitely on my track. The trackers make their way down an old logging road. Callie's footprints are well-defined in the soft soil. Hey, guys. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Good. Callie is found after two hours of searching. In the end, Bart and Darcy followed her tracks across two fields and through a forest till they found her. Had this been a real search, the search manager would have employed numerous sign-cutting teams working ahead to continually refine the subject's direction of travel. Ground SAR members would also be on scene searching areas of high probability and calling out for the lost person. Callie shows the trackers her route across the field. I saw some prints right here. Right, I... Tracking is one of these things like you're not born to it. It's just a learned skill. So it's just a matter of getting the right training and then doing lots of practice from there. Call out search and rescue features, real stories, 
filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.